properly for several months. I knew there were areas for concern, and I also knew that I hadn't slept properly for 18 hours. My body thought it was 4 o'clock in the morning, when actually it was 7 o'clock at night. But I was convinced that my part of the journey was safe, and the flight was the part I had to worry about. Ladies and gentlemen, today is not about aircraft, and it's not about cars, it's about safety. And the point I'm making here is that few of us really appreciate that safety is subjective. My acceptable level of safety depends on my experience. Your acceptable level of safety might be more stringent, or you might feel but I'm going a little too far. In order, to, in order to measure accessibility, regulators set standards and expect us to meet those standards on every trip our ships make. If we cut corners, if we fail to follow what is regarded as best practice, two things can happen. We might get away with it. There's no accident, no one is injured, no damage to your vessel, no pollution. Or, there might be an incident and you look foolish. Shipping professionals usually follow best practice. But investigations of an incident will reveal that minimum standards often overlook unusual circumstances. The incident report then outlines the events that led up to the accident, the events themselves, and the lessons the industry can learn. Look, we all know that shipping professionals are under increasing pressure, and the dangers of overlooking a vital stage in the navigation of a ship or the management of a company, or the 
handling of human resources can lead to serious consequences. My task today is to look at the role of the media, specifically related to maritime safety, and specifically here in the Baltic Sea. My initial point is that the media will not care whether professionals have been properly trained, how much pressure you are under, or what circumstances are. For the most part, the media sees an incident in isolation, an event, an accident involving life, or pollution, or damage to a ship or a berth. The media wants to know who is to blame. Now, whether we talk about the trained media, the general media, or the new social media, frankly, the level of professional knowledge is thin. This means that shipping companies unfortunate enough to be involved in an accident must have access to crisis crisis management capability. Someone who's brought in from outside to train senior executives and communications staff in how to stay one step ahead of the media. In the old days, by which I mean before Facebook and Twitter and the instant messaging circus, the trade media could be handled differently from the general media. Shipping periodicals had some background knowledge and wanted to know the chain of events that leads up to an accident. However, the general media have very little real understanding of shipping. They are attempting to find juicy details that often have no consequence and ridiculous sound bites from stressed executives in head office. The general media, here in Poland, or in Germany, or in Sweden, or anywhere, does not have your best interests at heart. When the MSC Napoli was beached on the south coast of England, I was interviewed by Sky Television. In the background, there was film of bounty hunters streaming down the cliffs to pick up whatever they could from the beach. Nappies and motorbikes were the two things that I remember most clearly. Now, I prepared for that interview by reading everything I could about the role of the Secretary of State's uh, Special Advisor for Salvage the heroic work of helicopter crews in plucking seafarers from lifeboats as they pitched and tossed in heavy English Channel waters, and the details of the ship's voyage. So I was prepared. Now the first question told me more about the general media than anything I had read or been told. Who owns the nappies? I generally tried to focus her attention on the real issues here. No one had been killed. There'd been no pollution. The ship is where it can best be stabilized for salvage. Excuse me, Mr. Clayton, who owns the motorbikes? The role of the general media in maritime safety is to provide their audience with whatever they want to read or see. If there is an accident, they want a culprit, someone to blame, a face to put on the front page or at the head of a primetime TV bulletin. They have no interest in what went right. They are focused only in what went wrong. If you have not prepared for this, if you are not willing to manage your reputation in the event of a major incident, you are exactly like the man who ignores the safety warnings on his car. 
one day, your time will come. Both the trade media and the general media can be handled, for better or for worse, by a crisis management team. Now we must turn our attention to the social media. This has changed the role of media in maritime safety beyond all recognition. <coughs> the driver now is not what was the chain of events that led up to the accident, or even who is to blame. The driver is speed. Getting the message out fast, updating it minute by minute, adding your own observations or thoughts to that swelling mass of sentiment. How can a company hit by an incident involving loss of life or pollution hope to counter this tsunami of ill-informed sentiment? In truth, Social media is so new that no one has been able to demonstrate how it can be done effectively. We are told that shipping companies need to have an in-house social media expert who is responsible for placing the company's own message across all the necessary social media outlets. While many of us have joined LinkedIn and understand how Facebook works, or even tweet from time to time, do we really know how to direct the flow <coughs> of that social media tsunami? I'm not even sure the crisis management experts, many of whom I know personally, are <coughs> young enough, young enough to take this new danger seriously. Companies are serious about keeping investors aware of financial results. New investments in ships, sale of assets, and managing their reputation at the stock market level. Why are they failing to take seriously the dangers of social media, which can be more damaging to reputations than a small slip in a quarterly profit statement? We only learn when we are at risk. This is a critical time for the shipping industry because we are all at risk, but only some of us are learning. Now, I believe the Costa Concordia tragedy can be regarded as an incident that defines maritime safety in the social media age. Costa Grogieri and Carnival Corporation made a number of basic safety errors that led to this grounding, badly coordinated evacuation, and unnecessary loss of life. There were thousands of wealthy vacationers on board with access to social media tools and the opportunity to use them. The result has been deeply damaging for the ship's operator, owner, and master, although it has been less damaging for the wider cruise industry. This is because maritime regulators have no investigatory report on which to base their conclusions, but they will wait as long as it takes. The social media circus has moved on. Many of the guests on Concordia will have enjoyed another cruise, this time without incident. The tweets they send home are probably about food and festivities on board and ashore. This patient wait for conclusions is what marks out maritime professionals. And I include the trade media in this from most bloggers and tweeters of the social media world. I recall being contacted in uh, September 2007 by the head of the UK's Marine Accident Investigation Branch, 
which analyzes shipping incidents and places recommendations on their findings. He wanted me to pay special attention to the report of an incident in the Baltic Sea. The Annabella had suffered a collapse of containers during a period of heavy weather while on its way to Helsinki. As a result of its analysis of this accident, the MAIB recommended that better communications was needed between shippers, planners, the loading terminal, and the vessel, so as to ensure a safe loading of a container ship. When combined with the investigation into the structural failure and flooding of the MSC Napoli, the agency identified a compelling need for a code of conduct for container shipping. And the specialist maritime media was the obvious channel for getting that message across. Earlier this year, in the February 2013 issue of Safety at Sea magazine, which is a sister publication to Fairplay. We read that extensive coverage of the dangers of counterfeit life-saving appliances was rewarded when the crew of a Unicom managed liquefied natural gas carrier checked their own man overboard signals and discovered that they were carrying one of the counterfeit beacons. The office issued claims against the supplier and a new one was received promptly after that. Keeping seafarers and their employers aware of developments in maritime safety is one of the responsibilities of trade publications. So the maritime media continues to play a role in identifying bad practice, commending good practice, and encouraging everyone involved to make safety their top priority. Thank you for listening. May you travel safely. <laughs>
or using LNG or using compliant fuel. If you go today to a bank, which often, with, with often a debt loaded ship, ship I usually have to pay, debt. and then you ask for money to invest in a scrubber. The bank will look at you and say, you should have your brains tested. So, this is what we are facing today. But again, on that, all of you so I don't go into this thing, but that, that will be a consequence, and that is not enough realized. Same with the discussions. Uh, there was an announcement from the Singapore government at Singapore Maritime Week the last week that the port of Singapore is going to offer a 25% discount to the uh, tariff, port call tariff, for any ships that have a scrubber fitted. So while I take on board Alphonse's view that the consumer should have to pay for it, I think the real answer is that the uh, payment must come from within the industry. And Singapore is always a lead proposer in these ideas. Let's see if we can do something similar in the Baltic. Okay. May I comment on that as well? What does, what does it mean? Yeah. Is, it, is it means that it's working or only fit? Just the word of a fit. I would imagine it working. I don't know if I Just uh, this is not new, but you mentioned because you have globally uh, the ports in what you call even EAHP, the International Organization of Ports, they have agreed to a system to reward environmental friendly ships, whatever that is, uh, with reductions in port values. But the reductions are marginal, so they will never compensate the huge in investment that the ship owners uh, have to, to make. So it's not new, but it's not enough. That's what I want to, to, to explain. And again, uh, I share the view expressed, the question expressed, do you mean fitting or working? This is a fair question. Uh, and you could have put it in a, in a kind of in a form attacking me and saying, why do you ship out? It's not, that's not going to happen. Now, uh, when this decision was taken in the IMO, uh, the many governments, the EU government involved in this decision, EU governments of we often call second countries. They realized that something went wrong. And some of them gave an indication that possibly we have to go back to the IMO and change this whole thing into a lot of percentage. That was the initial step for the government. And later on, some governments came up with suggestions to go for exemptions or exclusions for a period of, say, five years. But it didn't fly, it didn't work, because there was no unanimity, not even between the second government. 
that explains to some extent that somebody was waiting for this solution to correct the wrong. But in the meantime, the ship hours involved have not been sitting back and waiting. Some are testing scrubbers, some have installed scrubbers with subsidies, some have uh, ships with LNG. Initially, it was only Norway through the Box Fund subsidized. The Viking Landing is also subsidized. So, in a way, the initiatives taken up to date are subsidized. But that doesn't solve the problem as yet. Because, as I mentioned in my presentation, even if all of them would say we installed scrubbers, we can never deliver them by 2015. And it's not a question of complacency of ship hours, but rather ship hours faced with the wrong decision in the IMO. Member states realizing this, but not knowing exactly what to do about it. That's the only explanation, much to my regret, that I have to give. Uh, regarding this uh, question from uh, uh, regarding this carpets, uh, I'm from UF, I should be Lines local ship owner. So uh, the, we have to realize that uh, the one scrubber for, for main engine, 5,000 kilowatts, cost about $2 million. Uh, more or less, it depends on the dry or, or wet system. Uh, the dry is a little bit cheaper, but anyway, it's a cost of um, one scrubber for one engine. We are talking sometimes about the ferries for the four engines. So please realize what the costs are involved in such uh, projects. That is the one, uh, uh, let's say, question. The second um, is, uh, there is a general rule for the um, uh, classification societies that if you are installed um, equipment, it must work. It must work properly according to specification. If we can hear from the uh, manufacturers that they can obtain, approach such uh, topics, main topics of, of, for, for this equipment, how to install? How to install such equipment if you are not sure that it will be working? And you can be detained in any moment by the uh, port, port state control. And I think that is the main, uh, main problems for ship owners to decide. And the second is, uh, of course, it was mentioned here, is uh, money. Uh, now we are in a very um, tough time for ship owners, and it's not easy to invest such uh, such amount of money without any guarantee that it will be working. Thank you. Yeah. Also, the statement on a question that you just reminded me of something which I didn't mention, which is quite important. Uh, nobody, even the uh, scrubber manufacturers, will deny that the scrubbers don't work properly today, not yet. For example, they simply, if you ask for a five year guarantee for a continuous performance of 100%, you won't get it. So that's evidence that the thing doesn't work. The reaction from the producers is we are constantly improving our systems. But we have to go through a learning process. Now, and that's why I made a comment now. If you invest today, you get some support, you invest the two million you mentioned in scrubber. And within a year and a half, or within two years, the same manufacturer, what's that? comes up with a better system, which works, which works better, which is cheaper. What will the book value, the book value of your ship be within two years? You're working with a thing which doesn't work properly. In the other ships you will be working with good discoveries if they have exist. So the book value of your ship goes down. So if you look as an investor, why should I do this? It's a rhetoric question, I guess. My name is 
Maciej Dobłowski, położył się w dziecku na ziemi. I have a question to Richard. You mentioned about Costa, the Costa Concordia lesson. And my worry is that this lesson will be lost. And from the, the final emphasis will be on tightening various procedures on board the ship. But the last uh, indicated that there are also weaknesses in the dining of ships. And not much is uh, discussed on this point of design, on the aspect of the proper designing of passenger, passenger ships. The sh in fact, the ship sank in a very, in a short time, say about <coughs> one hour, whereas Titanic, it took half a day to sink. I mentioned about another accident in the Northern Sea, the boat case in December, in a sink within some 15 minutes. It was, it was a modern ship built five years ago in Virginia, having many decks. And in a, do you think IMO and the profession will manage to learn more than only regarding the aspect of various procedures on board the ship? It's interesting you bring up the Titanic because they're now doing the Titanic 2. And they were trying to rebuild the original Titanic. And I think people said to this uh, mining investor, there, are, there have been changes made to the safety of uh, uh, cruise ships over the past uh, 80 or 90 years. But he wasn't having any of that, so <laughs> I'm not sure he'll build the original Titanic. The Costa Concordia, I think, is a very interesting um, case study in how not to conduct a ship investigation. Um, the MAIB in the UK and the similar agencies in the US and in Australia have built up a very good reputation at pulling together expertise across the entire industry to look at why a ship went down and what recommendations we can make on the basis of that investigation. They can't accuse anybody of anything, that's not their purpose, but the recommendations are, I think, critical to, uh, to, to that report. And I know there's a lot of real concern within our industry uh, as to why the Italians have chosen to take the course they have in, in creating a criminal investigation before they start looking at the, the actual hard facts of the case. But as I said in my presentation, I, once we allow the emotion to, uh, to dissipate on this, and I think it's already gone to some extent, we really do need to look at what actually happened and how we can prevent that happening again. And to some extent, there is a naval architectural uh, case to be put as to whether this, this is a failure of design and a failure of construction, or is it just that the master was an idiot? Um, we don't know yet. It went down in January last year, and here we are in April, nearly in May, and we still haven't had that report published uh, publicly. So, I thank you for your, for your question. I think there's a lot that we going to come out on, on that, but I'm, just, I'm disappointed it's taken so long. Thank you very much, uh, all speakers, for, for your presentations, and uh, we should have our end of the day. Well, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to this conference, and I know it's, it's not about five in a row, and 
they have all been very successful, and we also have the book with all the papers we can read after the conference. It's, it's very professional how you do this. And we are very happy to tell you something about the risk and the risk models and the safety and dangers that we all face uh, on the sea. And uh, uh, we have, as the chairman said, been working uh, on that for a couple of years. Of course, I come from Denmark and uh, I will look at it with Danish eyes. And um, uh, you can see here a little map uh, of Denmark and the Danish king kingdom. And uh, you, you have to imagine that we uh, are a little bit split when we talk about safety at sea in, in Denmark because um, to your right, you can see what we are talking about today. Uh, it's a Baltic Sea, very, very busy uh, sea. And, the Danish straits, the, the very Danish, uh, the dangerous straits, narrow straits in, in Denmark, uh, has to carry all the, the traffic uh, in and out of the Baltic Sea. And of course, that is our main concern in, in Denmark uh, when we talk about safety. It's the passage of the Danish uh, straits. And to the left, you can see a part of the Danish kingdom, it's Greenland. And uh, of course, we have completely uh, different concern of that. Uh, but they, it's very dangerous as well, I can tell you. Uh, we see uh, more and more very, very large uh, cruise ships uh, going up there for, for tourism uh, on Greenland. And uh, I can tell you, if, if they go down up there on Greenland, nobody will uh, save them because there's nothing up there. So <laughs> it's another kind of danger. Maybe it's not more dangerous. Uh, to navigate up there, but if it goes wrong, it's, it's very, very dangerous because there's no search and rescue up there. So it's another problem we can face uh, in this very remote area. We also have the Faroe Islands, of course, uh, in the Atlantic Ocean, as you can see to the right. Extremely beautiful uh, scenery and very, very complicated to maintain, I can tell you, uh, when you want to paint the lighthouses. Uh, it's not that easy. As I told you, our main concern when we talk about uh, safety and, and risk and um, danger at sea is, of course, the narrow straits uh, in Denmark uh, that are, uh, as a matter of fact, very difficult to, to navigate. Um, we have, first of all, the, the great belt between Fyn and uh, Sealand and about uh, 35,000 ships uh, pass the Great Belt uh, every year. You can have a draft of 14, 25 uh, meters uh, through the Great Belt. And the more narrow sound uh, between uh, Denmark and Sweden, you can more or less best navigate on the Danish side of the sound because it's uh, deepest, but it's not more than 7.7 meters. And with that uh, relatively restricted draft, nearly 14,000 ships uh, pass the sound every year to and fro from uh, the uh, Baltic Sea. Uh, if you look to the south, um, what we call the Cadet Run, um, yeah. uh, almost 70,000 ships pass that uh, narrow point every year. <coughs> 10,000 of these ships are big tankers uh, with oil, uh, mostly to and from the, the Russian ports. Uh, of these 70,000 ships, uh, almost 40,000 ships go through the German key and uh, uh, more to your, to your left. And this is a real picture. It's based on the AS at the very narrow place in Denmark. And you can really see how, how narrow it is and how much traffic Look, look at the, <laughs> the pictures there. It's of course a little faster than normal, but uh, it gives you a good uh, view on how, how busy uh, the waters are. And you can see some very scary <laughs> situations there. Uh, and, and this is real. It's not something we made up. It's, it's a normal day uh, in Denmark. So, uh, what are the challenges to, to safety of navigation? Borders. Uh, do we see increasing traffic? Yes, we do. As uh, Madam Montesi told you, uh, 
uh, everywhere we see uh, increasing and, and see maybe the, uh, the squabble uh, problems and the environmental resources can help that picture I don't know that much. <laughs> uh, we see increasing uh, traffic uh, at sea and we see increasing oil transport in the Baltic Sea because the, um, the Russian ports are um, exporting more and more oil by ship uh, in the uh, Baltic Sea. We also see larger ships, uh, much larger ships, and also uh, the ferries, uh, lots of ferries, and they go faster and faster, uh, the ferries, to compete with other means of uh, transportation. And as we heard, it's also getting more and more complex. Uh, there are more and more users of the sea, more pleasure crafts, more wind farms, uh, complicated fishing uh, industries, and so on. So it's, it's getting more complex, and that's why we have uh, said that we need a, a technology-driven risk attention uh, to deal with this. We in Denmark believe strongly in AIS. Uh, we do not believe that much in Elrid anymore, but still there. <laughs> but we have put all our money into AIS. And we have just one month ago last uh, launched our own AIS satellite uh, from India. And uh, we are now receiving AIS pictures from the uh, Arctic area. And that helps us a lot to understand the, uh, the way the ships navigate in Greenland, the big cruise ships. We now know exactly where they go. And uh, uh, that helps us uh, mitigate the risks of there. But in Denmark, uh, in the area here, we have complete coverage of land-based, uh, shore-based uh, AIS. And also, as you know, uh, Denmark hosts all the servers for AIS in the Baltic region, for the Helcom server, and also for the North Sea, the North Sea server, and all your national uh, uh, installations transport your AIS tracks to the server in Copenhagen, and we distribute the whole picture uh, back to you. So. All of the countries around the Baltic Sea and in the North Sea should have this picture of AIS covering the whole thing. And AIS uh, is uh, the basis for our uh, risk uh, tools and risk assessment. We base everything on AIS now. AIS has, has, has made a revolution to uh, understanding uh, the ship uh, traffic. Let me give you an example. This is one of the most dangerous points uh, in uh, passing the Danish Straits. It's called Hadar. As you can see, the left water route nearly takes a 90 degree starboard uh, turn, and you have uh, a possibility of grounding on, on each side. And we had many groundings there. You can see the bottom to your right, one of the groundings. We had, as a matter of fact, many groundings there. And by studying the, yes, the historical AIS tracks, uh, we realize that the problem is very basic. It's simply that the shipmasters uh, turn a little bit too late. They simply cannot make the 90 degree turn and they hit uh, the reef, the had a reef uh, on the top. So it was not very complicated when, it, when we have studied the AIS tracks, it was very easy. And the solution was also very, very easy. Uh, we installed, as you can see, uh, six, six, uh, six yellow, yellow boys. It was maybe investment of 50,000 euros or something like that. <laughs> and uh, that was done in July 2009. And after that date, no ship has uh, grounded in heaven. So it's such an extremely easy solution uh, to something you, you believe is very complicated. Also, uh, after Fushan High uh, went down in, in, in the Baltic, north of Bornholm, uh, we, we uh, sent out a message that we will install a traffic separation scheme between uh, Sweden and Bornholm. Uh, and you can see this is the date when you, uh, uh, when you promulgated the uh, traffic separation scheme and the ships already started to act in accordance with uh, the, uh, the regulation and 
only a few days later when the, the, the first C maps came out, the C charts came out with the uh, with the um, separation scheme, you can see that all the ships acted uh, in accordance with uh, the regulation, and, and uh, we have seen no more data, no more um, collisions or, or groundings of there uh, since uh, that system was uh, made. So again, uh, you had a very easy solution and a very easy way to, to prove that uh, ships are actually uh, doing what uh, you tell them. This is then another problem. Many ships, uh, you can see to your left, they follow the traffic separation scheme and they have to turn 45 degrees uh, to the north to avoid the big island of Bonhoeff. It's very, very big. And many of them forget to turn. You think it's a lie, but it's correct. They simply forget to turn and they, you can see the, the, the AS track, they just keep on sailing and they end, as you can see on the right, on the shore of Bonhoeff. It's crazy, but it's a fact. And, and many times every year that happens. This is another uh, case where we have used the AIS uh, to, to look into what really went wrong. This is a bridge between uh, uh, the up in the northern part of Jutland, and it connects the northern part of Jutland and the southern part of Jutland. And it was hit by a ship. You can see the rail. Uh, it's not very usable after the, the collision uh, with the ship. And uh, this is, as a matter of fact, AIS track, and it's what happened is, this is correct. And you can see in the bottom, we can follow everything, course and speed, and so now look, the, the bridge is coming there. Uh, so, full speed ahead, and it hit the bridge, and uh, it's like a drum from the sailor. <coughs> But very uh, efficient, you can see at the bottom, you can see exactly what happened. If, if, if the shipmaster tells you that he, he only went uh, two knots, you can tell him that's a lie, because you, you, you went seven knots directly into the bridge, uh, and we have the proof here. So we use this AIS for evidence in court, and it's very, very, very effective. Now I will turn into pilotage because I guess in Poland, as in Denmark <coughs> and everywhere else in the world, pilotage is extremely complicated. And pilots are also extremely complicated. Any pilots here? <laughs> but it is complicated. In Denmark, it's, it's also complicated because the Danish Straits are international straits and we cannot make mandatory <coughs> pilotage in Denmark. So we have to ask ships to take uh, the pilot. Voluntary basis. Uh, the IMO has helped us. Helped us. They have uh, issued um, uh, some. Um, uh, they, they recommend to take a pilot when you are a ship at a certain uh, size uh, through the Danish waters. And uh, we have made a study in Denmark. Uh, it's a big consultant a company. Helped us Kofi consult. And uh, by studying Bosporus, the Turkish Straits looks very much like the Danish Straits, the Torres Straits in, in Australia and other parts of the world, they have uh, come to the conclusion that taking a pilot in these very complicated waters, if you make a, a risk assessment, taking a pilot will reduce the risk of an accident with 80%. And that's remarkable. I mean, if you can reduce your own risk by 80%, uh, everybody will do that. So we strongly recommend the ships going to Dennis Waters to take a pilot. And the red, uh, the red um, uh, curve at, at the bottom is the ships uh, passing in accordance with the IMO regulation. So the red uh, curve is the ships taking a pilot, and the green is all the ships passing in, in Denmark. So you can see most of the ships are acting in accordance with the IMO regulation, and that is very important for, for the safety uh, to, to, to take a pilot in these waters. That's our opinion. Now I will tell you a little bit about a, a real uh, a risk uh, management tool that we are developing in Denmark. And this is, it, it is working, what I was told by my engineers that I cannot show it because it's not working that good. But it 
will work very efficient, but at least I can I can tell you how it works, and I, I can assure that, that it is already uh, working at, at some stage. But I believe that this will be very important for the, uh, for the assessment of the maritime safety in Denmark, and of course later we will be as we will share it with everybody that would like to, to use it. Uh, it's a statistical method, and it will tell you the normal, uh, the, the abnormal behavior in a certain area um, that you have uh, chosen. And for us, it's, it's the Danish waters, of course. So what we are interested in is abnormal behavior, because we try to uh, make our measurement <coughs> on, on um, accidents. And as a matter of fact, there were very few accidents. So maybe one or two a year it was really not possible to make any assumption out of uh, accidents. So we would like to see on the nearness and on the abnormal behavior. So uh, this system will, will tell you if, um, if, if it takes abnormal behavior, either uh, from the ship's course and speed or uh, uh, nearness. And the nearness is done by making these ellipses around the ship as safety ellipses and uh, the, the question of how big this ellipses is, uh, is, is, a, is a question of how big the ship is. If you're a large ship you need a big uh, ellipses around you, if you're a small ship you need a small ellipses around you. If I'm a, in my very small pleasure craft I'm happy to be 20 meters from a big tanker, it doesn't worry me very much. But on the bridge of the tanker, it's very unpleasant to have been 20 meters uh, from the ship. So the ellipsis is a question of how, how big your own ship is. And then we have divided uh, the whole Denmark up in a small number of cells. And the cell is 400 times 400 meters, so a relatively small cell. And uh, within that cell, uh, the area's tracks are automatically recorded. So the system will be more and more clever every day. Um, for instance, in that little red cell you can see there, uh, after some time, and, and the system is already relatively clever now, after some time it will tell us that this ship, if it's a cargo ship this size, is normally sailing across 300 with 12 knots. That is the normal behavior in that little cell. And if a ship is going another way, uh, faster or slower, it is abnormal behavior. And then the, the, the system will give you a notice that a ship is having abnormal behavior in that little cell there. Uh, for instance, uh, this is an, an, another little cell, red, and uh, a, 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 the example is a 230 meter long tanker is observed in this cell, number 567, and it's going 300 uh, degrees, speed 17 knots, and, and, and uh, that is the normal behavior. Um, this is, the, this is a, an abnormal behavior in that cell, and you will have an alarm uh, on, on, on your uh, screen. Also, the, the system is collecting near-miss uh, collisions, and again, it's the uh, ellipses around the ship. Uh, you can see here it's the same picture as before, and um, when the ellipses are uh, crossing each other, it is uh, described as a near-miss. So, not that many, really, but some of them are. And of course you need to study this afterwards, because they are not all near this. You need a navigator to look into it uh, afterwards, because fer the ferries are very close to each other and they, are very, uh, they, they know that. And that's not a near miss, that's a, uh, something they do every day, so that's not calculated as a near miss. But some of them are really uh, near misses, and, and that is what the system should detect and give you uh, a warning about. But again, very complicated. And the system will be more and more clever. That's the whole idea uh, of, of how it works. So this is a real near-miss example uh, that has been studied. And you can see uh, you have 
the, the ship one and ship two, and you will have the screen, and you have you will have the name of the ship, and you will have the situation, and you can really see here how they are maneuvering to avoid each other, and that is really near this. It's, it's just a, a, it, it could have went very wrong. Also, you have near miss groundings, and these are real examples from the system. Uh, the ship to your right is doing the right thing, turning to the left, and the other ship. Had, had only one minute, one minute to hit the ground there. Uh, eventually it turned, but uh, it, it was a near miss uh, grounding, and that can be used for, uh, for risk mitigation. Then I will tell you shortly about what we call the IREP Mark II system. IREP stands for IANA. Are you familiar with IANA? International Association of Marine Routes to Navigation and Lighthouse Authority very easy name. Uh, I, I guess all your countries are member of IALA and you can get this system for free. Uh, it's available, uh, I guess it's almost available at their website, but otherwise you can get it and it's, it's used everywhere in the world now to make risk management <coughs> and uh, also recommended by the IMO uh, when you uh, make uh, risk management it stands for IELA Waterway Risk Assessment Program. It's based on known, uh, known uh, theories by, by many people, and it's a probabilistic and quantitative system, and it counts for collision scenarios and grounding scenarios. Uh, and it's a very basic algorithm. It's simply the, the number of annual groundings is the number of grounding candidates um, and uh, the causation probability. So it's it's, it's very very easy uh, algorithm, and it's also based on a number of assumptions, of course, uh, that you can read here. Uh, relatively easy uh, assumptions. And then, uh, based on many many many. Statistics and interviews, and IELA has made some default uh, causation probabilities that you can read here. We are working on head on collisions, overtaking collisions, and so on, and you have the causation factor uh, to your right. And that has been uh, tested against historical uh, scenarios many, many places on the world now, uh, on the globe, and it, it, it matches with the history. So you use the system on a certain um, waterway and you look back, maybe 10 years back, and see how many accidents really happen and, and they match. So you use it historically to prove that it's working and then you use it as a um, management tool for the future. And these are the scenarios that uh, the system works on uh, to ground six collision scenarios. The difficult part is to, uh, to measure the candidates for groundings and collisions. And to find the candidates, you use the historical LS data. Uh, and then you uh, look, you take for instance a year of IS historical data, and then you look into where the ships uh, mostly position themselves in the waterway. And you can see here the, 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 red, the red is the southbound uh, ships, the blue is the northbound ships in a narrow uh, uh, waterway. And then you <coughs> can see where, where, the, 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 uh, where most ships are passing, it's the highest point, and where the best ships are passing is it's the lowest point, and then you can simply find the number of ships that are candidates for grounding in this area here. And this is a real picture again from, from Göteborg, and it looks like he, he simply used the, the light, lighthouse as a waypoint and forgot to turn, but that happens, and he, he, walk, he would have been a candidate in the system. And uh, it's very basic. The, the use of the system is extremely basic, and we just had 
one of our engineers in Papua New Guinea. Uh, he spent a week and then he had a complete risk assessment of the waters in Papua New Guinea uh, that, that they uh, should use for uh, submission to the IMO. And uh, you simply define the area, you gather a sea charge, you define the route, you allocate traffic to the route legs, you define relevant grounds, and then you simply do the calculation and it's just to push a button. The system looks like this. And this is you defined your, your <coughs> tools. Uh, I think this is the Gulf of Oman. You uh, use the historical GIS of the tracks. You uh, define the links that you would like to, uh, to make your risk measurement at. And then you, uh, you, the system will calculate, as I told you, um, where most ships are uh, passing the route that you have chosen and which of the ships would be candidates for grounding or collision. <coughs> and then you push a button and uh, at the button to your left you can simply see a, a number that will tell you the risk for power groundings, drifting groundings and so on. Uh, that is accepted by the IMO. You can also have a visual picture the darker the color, the higher the risk of an accident. So you can uh, plan where you will uh, put your boys and aids to navigation, and, and you can do that cost effectively. And then you can automatically upload to ILA website so other people can use it. So that's of this session is entitled Energy Projects by Bogdan Budakowski, Secretary General of Ports Organization. The main aim of LNG in Baltic Sea Ports is to promote a harmonized approach towards LNG bank and, bank and filling infrastructure in the Baltic Sea area. The project's idea is to deliver both credible know-how on LNG as a marine fuel and to respond to IMO sulfur requirements. One of the most vital problems is to the close, the close proximity of ports to city centers. Therefore, it is necessary to find out if for safety reasons bunkering is possible what is the best banking model and what, what conditions must be met to establish practical and safe energy operations. Therefore, the feasibility studies is being performed. Thank you very much. If I change the presentation, uh, I maybe should say that I'm not sure if I will be able to tackle uh, Last questions that you raised, uh, the project you just started, and of course we are dealing with uh, safety issues while bunkering, but uh, I'm afraid I'm not uh, able to give a, a real answer right now. Yes, thank you very much. I think the last speech was very exciting, and uh, I'm not sure if I can compare it with, with uh, moving uh, ships around. I'll, tr I'll try to do my best to, to uh, keep you awake for the next uh, 15 minutes. Uh, yes, let me start with a short introduction about the port organization. We are the biggest organization governing uh, the main ports uh, from the Baltic region. You could see uh, a map oh, with the dots, and the dots are members. And the, the members are all from all the countries around the Baltic. Uh, and I just realized that we don't have anyone from Greenland. <coughs> Still, it is a, a part of the Kingdom of Denmark, but uh, no port from Greenland yet. Uh, well, uh, we deal with uh, 
different issues, as you can see, uh, and we also deal with uh, EU affairs. And when it comes to uh, the question of consequences of sulfur regulations, of course, this is a real uh, issue for, for the maritime business, including the ports. And uh, we were, as a force organization, we were raising our voice uh, quite often, trying to tell that uh, this, the way this uh, regulation has come to the force was not the, the best one. Uh, we are also trying to say to the commissions that uh, we have to, in Europe, we have to apply the same rules over all of Europe. So we don't want different rules in policy compared to many drugs, for example. Uh, well, but, but let's come back to, to shipping. Uh, I just want to uh, show you two maps. The first map is showing rural and ferry connections in, in the Baltic. And you could learn from this map where are the main hubs of, of, uh, of cargo. So you could see that the main cargo is going probably from by, by ferry, uh, by rural ships, from Finland uh, to Germany, uh, also from southern uh, uh, Sweden to Germany. When it comes to passenger traffic, it's, it's between the triangle of uh, Helsinki, uh, Tallinn, and Stockholm, and also, of course, uh, between uh, uh, German ports and Swedish ports. Uh, there is, of course, some traffic between uh, Swedish ports and, and Świnoujście, and Gdynia, and Gdańsk, but not that fast as in other parts uh, in the Baltic. We try to calculate how many ships are sailing uh, in this cycle. <coughs> So for a uh, ferry uh, fleet, there are uh, 117, and for rural, it's 75, so it's a bit less than 200 on the service in the Baltic Sea. Maybe I should say that what, what is in, in, uh, in rural ferry uh, is this the trade between Baltic countries. It's probably obvious. When it comes to container map and container traffic, it's a bit different. You can see that the loops, so the big ships are coming to the North Sea ports and Orkus and Göteborg and Gdańsk. Then the, uh, the, the, the containers are being transshipped by smaller feeder vessels. And, and the, the cargo in containers are, of course, uh, rather cargo going from uh, further destinations like Asia. But again, we try to calculate the, the, the number of, of vessels in the containers uh, sector, and it is uh, about 150. So, uh, and, and the, the statistic, the trend shows that the, that the feeders are bigger and bigger with time. But the question, of course, is what happened with all these ships? This is just liner ships uh, after 2015. And, and the fact is that nobody knows. As I told you, we were, uh, as a part of the organization, we were trying to follow, uh, we were in the process uh, of, of consequences of, of the sulfur uh, directives and the sulfur IMO uh, regulations. Uh, so, at one side, we were criticizing, but, but we said, of course, being uh, uh, on the side of, of the industry that criticizes this development, we have to also take a, a positive uh, role and, and uh, we, we try to see and, and uh, somehow be in dialogue with the Commission uh, what solutions we can uh, find. And uh, we've been to many meetings with the Commission and, and we also started this toolbox. Uh, some people are saying the toolbox is empty. Uh, toolbox uh, that should support uh, uh, shipping industry and the ports uh, when it comes to consequences of sulfur regulations. But uh, we thought that the, the Commission come to quite good uh, solutions when it comes to LNG. However, LNG is a very long term uh, development, it's not for now, it's for future. 
So uh, we have uh, initiated among our members the project called LNG in the Baltic Seaports. We have delivered the proposal for 10T motorways of the sea program in 2011. It has been uh, evaluated by, by, by the Commission, by people uh, in Brussels, and they, they accepted it. So what's the project about? The project is the network of seven ports in the Baltic. If I can start from Denmark, <coughs> it's Aarhus, it's uh, Copenhagen Malmö, the one, one authority. Uh, then it is Stockholm, it's, uh, 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 it's then, then it's Finland, it's uh, Helsinki and Turku. Then it's uh, Tallinn. simple is to try to develop uh, and plan uh, LNG infrastructure, uh, I mean infrastructure for balance, uh, bunkering of LNG uh, for ships in the future. And, and, and uh, the, the other goal is to do it in a harmonized way. So it's, it's not like uh, every single port is, is doing its own, it's, it's harmonized approach. Uh, well, you, you cannot read this. But, but this shows uh, matrix that every port, every set, every port uh, is doing their own planning, and then there is a, uh, a harmonization approach. I try to uh, to zoom some of the activities so you can see, for example, what what port of Stockholm is is doing. Uh, they do feasibility studies for for LNG uh, infrastructure in port of in port of Stockholm. They do the bunkering arrangements, so what, what <coughs> to organize bunkering in the board. Safety manual, uh, project study, uh, so localization studies, uh, investment plans. So th that's uh, the task that the Port of Stockholm is, is going to do. <coughs> for example, Tallinn. Tallinn is also doing feasibility study, general plan for LNG facilities in, in Muga Harbor, the main part. Port. Uh, e EIA reports, layout options, and also preparing the tender documents. Uh, yes, so, so this is the, the real uh, example of what ports are, are preparing. And then when it comes to harmonization, uh, uh, we, between the ports, uh, we agree that, uh, uh, that harmonization means that the the LNG infrastructure will be developed in uh, a grid time schedule. That's the one point. The second point is that there will be a harmonization when it comes to design of, of terminals, for example, or bunker stations or bunker vessels. And then the, there will be a, or there is a harmonization when it comes to preparing the safety uh, rules while bunkering. And the last uh, point is communication. So. Uh, the ports agreed also to communicate uh, with uh, local uh, societies that LNG is a safe fuel, not uh, afraid of LNG. Uh, there will be also, or there is also a, a so-called stakeholder platform. So we are trying to uh, to talk with shipowners what they plan, what ports should uh, if uh, the shipowners be able to bunker LNG in the future, and I have to be honest that we are having the problem to get the real feedback from, uh, from ship owners. Uh, I, I of course understand ship owners that this is a rather a big problem, but in order to uh, the ports to be prepared, we at the moment don't really know what the ship owners are, are planning. We also promised to deliver an LNG guidebook that will be the guide guides not only for the members of the pro, uh, project but for the other ports. Uh, 
Yes, well, this is the organization chart. Well, when you want that important now. Uh, yes, and, and you probably know that there is a, a first vessel uh, fueled by LNG sailing between Stockholm and Turku, and this is beating the great and quite big vessel already on service from uh, January. Uh, in fact, I've been with my colleague in, in Turku uh, during the construction of this ship. It was in September, and then a few months later, uh, she's already on the water, sailing between ports of Stockholm and uh, Turku. And Stockholm and Turku are part of this project as well. When it comes to bunkering, uh, there, there is a, a bunker vessel, and it is rebuilt from a small uh, fjord ferry from uh, Norway. Um, so you could see on the, on the left, uh, sorry, on, the, on the right side, uh, on the left side, uh, uh, the, the previous shape of, of the ship, and then below you could see uh, the ship after rebuilding. And uh, there was uh, a ceremony to give the name to this. Uh, in March, so in fact, as far as I know, between January, when the Viking Grey ship was on the red on the service, the bunkering was done from cisterns from onshore. So LNG fuel was taken by, by, by trucks from the uh, small LNG terminal, 60 kilometers or so from uh, Stockholm, delivered to, to the the key and, and, and the bunker uh, from the truck, but now the, the vessel is on the service. Uh, well, uh, I just want to comment again uh, the question of competition. As I said, EPO is uh, very much aware of what's going on uh, in this region. We think, as I said already, that the same rules should be applied all Europe. When we compare um, other regions uh, in Europe, that's obvious that the, the cost of transportation in the Mediterranean will be cheaper than in the Baltic. So uh, the cargo that goes from Asia, for example, can go also to the Baltic port and, and being uh, transported by land to Central Europe. Uh, so this port from southern to uh, a less stricter uh, environmental rules, which will create not balanced uh, market uh, conditions. Uh, maybe just one update. Uh, you probably have heard uh, that EU launches uh, the so-called clean fuel strategy, uh, including the development of uh, LNG in shipping. So it seems to me that LNG very uh, that Commission very much promote LNG as a fuel. They said in this strategy that every uh, port being part of four TNT networks, so big ports in Europe, it's like more than 80 of them, I think, uh, should have LNG as a fuel after the, the year 2020. So the time is, is, uh, is approaching, it's running. I should also say that uh, within BPO we have uh, delivered another application, which is LNG in the Baltic and Black Sea ports. That means that another port joined this group uh, of ports uh, dealing with LNG, but also some Black Sea ports uh, wanted to be a part of this initiative. Uh, just to sum up, I'd like to say that Baltic ports go for LNG to offer LNG bunkering possibilities for ship owners in the future. Uh, but uh, again, LNG of course will not solve uh, the problem until 2015. At the moment we have only one ship, and probably this ship would not be on service without the support of Finnish government. Uh, and uh, I think it's also uh, wise to underline that ports, of course, did uh, need a, a business partners, partners to 
level of LNG infrastructure. So at the end, it must be a business for, for the private companies like, like bunkering, uh, like uh, gas operators, gas traders, um, terminal uh, investors. I said that. Uh, as I also, I also said, there is a big uncertainty what happens in, in the Baltic uh, after 2015. So the question is still open, and, and uh, I, I don't have uh, any, any answer to that, to be honest. You are very welcome to, uh, to visit the, the website of LNG, <coughs> the Baltic Seaports. <coughs> easily to Google it, and if you need any any more information, uh, please contact me. Thank you very much. <coughs> safety criteria were developed in response to casualties at sea, and they automatically adopted the prescriptive form as they were to counteract recurrence of particular casualties. In terms of logic, this is the inductive approach. It means that it is reasoning from specific to general. And the Logic says that if we apply such approach, the exemptions will occur. The history of safety criteria development confirms this rule of logic. And in consequence, we have today a growing number of regulations that the industry has problem to absorb. The proliferation of regulations causes a proliferation of controlling auditing bodies. This uh, approach to assuring, assuring safety at sea creates the regulatory compliance culture based, based on a set of regulations that do not form a coherent system of the spirit of the maritime safety. This culture assumes that the more inspections the more regulatory compliance can be expected. However, an excessive number of inspection bodies generates an adverse attitude to safety and could be destructive to the safety system as a whole. Therefore, instead of the culture of regulations, we have to be the culture of safety. It can be done if we apply the deductive approach to the develop development of safety regulations which means that the reason from, from general to specific. The only way to do that is to apply the risk models in which the reason from general to, to specific is applied. It can be done in the form of goal-based standard safety level approach presented by NCOs. Thank you very much. Please, another comments and questions, of course, related to the three presentations. I got one question to the last presentation regarding LNG projects. Uh, LNG is said to be the fuel of, of the future. We know that it is um, very good for the environment due to very low emissions. And at least today it's much cheaper than the, the regular marine fuel. Um, 
but we must also remember that uh, for a ton of LNG, we need twice as much space as for regular marine fuel. So uh, we also need a special cryogenic tanks, a special fuel supply system of LNG to, to, to the engines. And um, we must also remember that right now LNG is not allowed by solars to be used in, uh, as a fuel because of its low ignition temperature. So it, it can be only applied in, in a local trading or maybe between uh, two states which have agreed to, to use uh, this LNG as a, as a fuel. So my question is, uh, does it make sense to, to build a completely new infrastructure for LNG in, in the Baltic Sea? Who will use the infrastructure? And uh, do you think that uh, in case of, of big ocean-going ships, the LNG can be a, a real uh, alternative to, to this regular marine fuel. Thank you. Well, it, it's a very basic question, and if you don't have an answer, you will say it's a good question. Uh, well, I don't know, uh, to be honest, uh, but w w w when we are observing w what's going on in, uh, in Europe, uh, what, what the regulator commission is, is doing, also, when you look at, at uh, uh, what Dean uh, Pau, for example, is telling uh, us, uh, we see the potential. I'm not saying that there will be only LNG ships in the future. Uh, so, uh, we, from the port side, we think that we have to do our lessons and, and try to be ready for this type of fuel. Uh, when it comes to real investments in the ports, I'm saying that it must be business. So, uh, port authorities are only the facilitator of, of the business process. At the end, they have to find uh, a real uh, private businesses. So, this will, in fact, uh, uh, be um, a test for, for the, for the businesses. Uh, from the other hand, you could see that there are uh, bankering companies who are already planning uh, LNG distribution in the Baltic, so they're, they're, and they're spending lots of money for that. So, uh, just summing up, we in the boards, we see potential, but we are, of course, not certain how uh, uh, how many ships uh, will be sailing with LNG? I don't know this. When it comes to big vessels uh, going uh, uh, through the oceans, I'm not sure if this is the best uh, options to, to, to go with LNG whole uh, way for the uh, inner intra Baltic uh, uh, liner shipping. Uh, we see such a potential. Okay, uh, I, I have one question to Mr. Sakari uh, about the Ramona case, because I have heard uh, the explanation from the other side, from the, from the, from the captain's side, uh, how, how it happens, and, and up to him, he was ordered to proceed with good speed because the bridge uh, was supposed to be open, and uh, the ship arrived just in time for passing, passing the bridge, but it was still closed because the train has, had been a bit late that was uh, from Fredericia to Copenhagen. So he had a very unpleasant surprise when he came, came round, round the corner. Thank you. It was not uh, meant to, uh, to accuse anybody of anything. It was just an example of how he could use uh, as, as evidence in court. We have really investigated that case with the Ramona for, for a long period. And as a matter of fact, there are many things that went wrong. Uh, the communication between the ship and the bridge was not okay. The communication between the bridge and the train was not good. 
um, and he had too much speed. Uh, and no matter what, the bridge keeper is saying, you should not hit the bridge with seven knots. I mean, <laughs> uh, it's, it's not the way it should be. Done. So there are many, many uh, problems uh, in that case, and it was it was not. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry if it, if it was uh, understood that way. It was not to uh, accuse him of anything, but just to show that the AI is, is, is very, very powerful tool. Uh, to uh, for investigation of, of accidents. Uh, yeah, good afternoon. My name is Hans from Light and Wild. I'm on the station. I have a question to uh, Bogdan Olekowski. Um, yeah, it's a bit similar question to to the LNG issue and, and uh, about this, so to say, chicken egg problem. Uh, that, uh, as I understood, the, uh, the TNT co-financed uh, projects in the ports is it's, it's more related to the LNG distribution channels or bunkering stations. Because if, uh, uh, like, uh, we also have a, we had a seminar and we, we also talked to, uh, to different Norwegian companies, also the LNG suppliers, as that is their part of the business. That if there's a question, is there a problem to supply the LNG, there's no problem. The same is the track. Of course, the question is about the volume and the price. So, uh, if it's co-financing of the bunker stations, uh, the question will be, it's, a, it's actually at the end, it's a private business, not the public function of the Port Authority. It might be the issue to make uh, infrastructure. But afterwards, it's a question of the private business for one thing. And that is the question, is there a business? Or there will be a business in short time, so to say. A bit like the question. Yes, when it comes to what is really finance, uh, I have to say that it, it could be, or it is, uh, in some ports, uh, LNG, uh, small terminals. In some ports, it's... Uh, Bunker uh, vessels, well, maybe not really vessels, but, but the, uh, the work that board are uh, performing is how to organize uh, the bunkering from the bunker vessels without having uh, an terminal. For example, the sinking is not planning any, any terminal, but they know that there will be an terminal in Tallinn or in another Finnish uh, ports. So the question is how to bring this. Uh, LNG from these terminals to Helsinki. Uh, some ports are uh, thinking or trying to see if there is an option to build onshore LNG uh, station, bunker station onshore. So it's different type of uh, infrastructure. It's not just one model uh, for every port. So the ports must decide if they want to offer LNG and if yes, in what what solution that they would propose. Okay. I have a question to, uh, to Ms. Jost. Uh, I would like to continue what, what Dr. Rakowski said in his, his comments. Uh, what's, what's your opinion when global standard safety level approach can become a prevailing method in safety assurance and uh, if it is so, does it mean that the convention should be rewritten? I mean, so that's an argument and so on. Thank you very much. Um, that is a question where I would say I would have to give the answer we can't. Because we have already started as I tried to explain with regard to specific exchange of what has been prescribed by the way. But, but for, for going further by allowing for an interchange, not for a specific design, but for a concept, we would have to invest in more research, I'm afraid, actually, because with the European funding projects on safe door and goals, we have now established how to actually achieve a risk concept and risk measurement, but we still lack 
risk evaluation criteria, and we still lack a general concept of how to define a number that represents safety. And that is where we have to learn by doing. So currently we are developing an animal, an IGF group that is um, go, uh, supposed to be goal-based. That is where ships will then be allowed to be designed to be fueled by gas, by different kinds of gas, not only LNG, but others as well. And where the functionalities that are meant to be supporting a safety case in these circumstances would then have to be followed. And likewise, the polar code that is developed. We are currently likewise uh, rewriting uh, the concept of life-saving appliances in, within zones. And with these three very different examples, we will then have to go back and review whether or not it does help to develop, um, let's say, a solar for the 21st century. But um, if we were to do it as a full rewrite, we would have to invest time-wise and money-wise in working up a, two different safety standards in parallel because we would still have to maintain um, a upkeeping of the current solos and in parallel try to develop something new. That is something where I don't think at least we would be prepared to go for at this stage because a new solos would then probably need to have some economic incentives to actually enter into force. So, my first choice would be to continue to the way that we have started on in looking at specific areas where improvement is necessary right away and try to rewrite gradually how um, updated <coughs> solace that actually allows for more technical development and as Mr. Jankowski brought, uh, proposed, a, de a development from generic <coughs> Uh, in a way of improvement. Thank you. Uh, I feel obliged to comment your statement that owners do hesitate to indicate uh, their needs in uh, some way. And uh, there are a few reasons for that. And first of all, uh, the document uh, you were uh, referring to on clean power for trans, uh, transport. Uh, there is a chapter uh, referring to such a point. What is being proposed on national strategies? And uh, down below there is a statement. Member states should also define possible supporting measures such as direct incentives for purchase of alternative fuel services, possible tax incentives to promote alternative fuels for vessels. And uh, in Poland, there are very restrictive measures and the Minister of Finance never responds positively on our applications for state aid for public transport. So uh, we are very much for that uh, in, uh, initiative by the Commission to establish European Sustainable Shipping Forum. Uh, I suppose the text I will delegate uh, very professional experts to LNG panel and to, to the other uh, panels like finance, financing mechanism. And we shall be uh, uh, discussing how to divert certain tendencies that there are only 12 ships flying Polish flag are still in the operation. And soon it will be less than 10 for different reasons. First of all, they are over 25 years old or 
uh, technically maybe uh, not uh, fitted to, to these restrictive conventional uh, obligations and so on. And MLC is also a problem in a way for the future and owners are now discussing their budgets how to uh, maintain uh, technical uh, criteria of the vessels and of course how to implement MLC and of course about their future investments. So there are several aspects of that. On Monday next, uh, the Commission is organizing in Warsaw a seminar uh, on uh, alternative fuels, but it refers to air, uh, road transport, railways, and of course shipping. And we somehow enforced that the leading producer of uh, bunker in Poland, they delegate their people in order to somehow uh, uh, teach them that there is a potential for uh, production, or increased production, or maybe the investments. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Last one. I can see. Thank you. I would like to thank the speakers <coughs> and those who contributed to the discussion. Thank you very much. Now it's a break for lunch. The session three will start 20 past three. Of shipping on the Baltic. 
Let me say that Hasi was mentioned this month in the way when we talk about sea and safety and security. We are not just talking about European Union, we are talking about global uh, effect, global impact, global rules. So the main responsible for establishing the rules are the International Maritime Organization. The role of the European Union is, of course, to support all the debate in the context of the International Maritime Organization. And once the regulation is adopted, transpose the regulation into the EU law. And also to ensure that the, the law is enforced and implemented. So this will be the role of the EU. But we are in an international context, so we are facing ja tylko tak w skrócie podsumuję to, co zostało powiedziane, bo nie jestem w stanie wszystkiego to zapamiętać. I na pewno tezy podkreśla, że jeżeli chodzi o te regulacje prawne, są to regulacje prawne globalne dotyczące redukcji emisji. W związku z tym są to działania przede wszystkim imowskie. I w zasadzie od IMO Unia Europejska przejmuje i własne populacje w tym momencie wydaje, ale chodzi nam o globalne zmniejszenie emisji budwań buziarki i szkodliwych emisji ze sektorów. Trzeba pan proszę mogą liczyć na pomoc Kiem? Unii Europejskiej i Kienczykonius... dostosowanie swoich statków do tych umowów. So rely on the European Union to provide some assistance so that they can comply with these regulations and new requirements which are issued by the European Union. What, what is for us at the level of the European Union that we have some different funds and now we are discussing a new envelope for the period 2014-2020. It's what we call the fund the new funds for investment could be funds for support at the fisheries level, to support economic activities at the sea, to support the regional cooperation, to support agricultural cooperation. Now, all these funds are being managed by the national authorities. And at this moment, we are in a place where in each member state, we are preparing each member state is preparing the main objective of the new fund. So we'll be under the responsibility of each member state to define what will be the priority for the years of the fund. <laughs> Jak to zostanie rozwinięte, jak to zostanie opracowane w poszczególnych krajach, to się dopiero okaże. Przepraszam, że taka skrótowa, ale mam nadzieję, że wersję angielską większość rozumie doskonale. Uh, yes, perhaps uh, to this question, the previous one. Uh, the EU member states, if they want to change something in the IMO, where there is EU competence, to make myself clear, EU competence means that if there is EU legislation, a regulation or a directive, on an IMO, international ILO legislation, then there is EU competence. That means that if a member state wants to propose something, to change something in that IMO or ILO legislation, it must be agreed with EU coordination. That means that the member states all have to agree to this, and the coordination is done by the Commission. So there is a question of EU competence there. Czyli jest rzeczywiście tutaj pewna rola Unii Europejskiej, Komisji Europejskiej, pewne kompetencje Komisji Europejskiej, ponieważ jeżeli jakiekolwiek propozycje są przedstawione, w Komisji Europejskiej kraje członkowskie dyskutują nad tym, czy popierają, czy też nie popierają daną nową inicjatywę ustawodawczą, czy nowe wymogi.
I can give you a practical example that makes it clear. Uh, in the discussions on sulfur, the French government proposed at a certain moment to the other member states in the Commission, in coordination, to propose to approach the IMO for having exemptions to applying the 0.1% on certain routes, certain vessels, and what have you. The French government only got support from two member states, so the thing didn't was not carried on. It's quite important to notice it, but it may come back. Uh, on the support thing, that was your second question from you, I believe. May I, may I, for a moment, sure. just a few words? Z takim przykładem tego rodzaju działania i wpływu państw członkowskich na te decyzje była na przykład sprzeciw zgłoszony przez rząd francuski. Jedynie trzy inne państwa poparły tę propozycję. Jedynie trzy inne państwa w tym momencie poparły tą propozycję. W związku z tym ta inicjatywa, ta propozycja upadła. Ale tego rodzaju dyskusje też odbywają się w Komisji Europejskiej. Żeby wyłączenia dopuścić. Żeby dopuścić, tak. Żeby dopuścić wyłączenia. Tak. Uh, and then on the other point, the, the support measures, uh, as explained by uh, the Commission, uh, the Commission has many instruments to give support. In this specific case, it is, as long as it exists, Marco Polo, it is the Trans European Networks Transport, uh, it is the European Investment Bank. And it is uh, stated by member states. Uh, but Olof will explain this a little more in the detail, but perhaps Olof, you want to give a comment on that. Pan Wieden w trzeciej sesji powie nam więcej na ten temat i wyjaśni. Ja tylko mogę po prostu polecić Państwu posłuchanie tej trzeciej sesji. Niestety, jak zacznę notować, to zacznę Państwu tłumaczyć dokładnie. Is uh, uh, <clears throat> according to the to the national state aid we have in Finland we have now uh, the first mover with the state aid for Scarborough installations. But uh, I will come back to to, the, back to this in in my presentation this afternoon. But we do have a big challenge. We have a time window open now for doing the applications for the installations, uh, and uh, we face a big uh, great methodological problem in the EU environmental state guidelines, how to implement. And uh, that's that, that's an ongoing question. Thank you. Jeżeli chodzi o pomoc państwową w Finlandii, to w tej chwili mamy taką opcję, mamy tak zwane otwarte okno, czyli okres, kiedy możemy zgłaszać swoje aplikacje o dofinansowanie. Ale mamy jeszcze z tym wszystkim problem, w jaki sposób to realizować, w jaki sposób to rozliczać, a dalsze szczegóły usłyszą Państwo podczas mojej prezentacji. Może istotne dodać, że 115 statków podnosi banderę chińską, bo pomoc jest powiązana z banderą narodową. So maybe it's worthwhile also to add that uh, under the Finnish flag there are 115 vessels, so there's quite a few, and the state aid is open only to ship owners who fly the Finnish flag. And has Finland uh, established a special fund for this purpose? Yes, we have. We have uh, the government uh, has uh, uh, put uh, in uh, 30 million euros in the uh, state budget for 2013 and 2014, and uh, the aid intensity is 50 percent. So we can do investments for 60 million euros, and they they have 50 percent state aid. Tak, rzeczywiście ten fundusz w tej chwili wynosi 30 milionów euro. Jest przeznaczony na okres roku 2013 i 2014. I trzeba pamiętać, że zgodnie z tego funduszu pomoc wynosi 50%. Więc de facto można powiedzieć, że mamy 60 milionów euro przeznaczonych na 
unowocześnienie czy na dokonanie czynności, by te wymagania zostały spełnione, wymagania właśnie redukcji emisji. Co jest istotne, jest to w gestii w zarządzie ministra ochrony środowiska. And what is also important, this is within the capacity of the Ministry of Environmental Protection. What is the situation of the German flag? Is it increasing or decreasing? Any help from the government to the German ship owners? I takie pytanie jeszcze od dziennikarzy, od jednego z dziennikarzy do Pani Jost. Jak wygląda sytuacja w flagi niemieckiej? Czy w tej chwili jest wzrost ilości statków, czy też nie? Oraz czy planowana jest jakaś pomoc na armatorów? Of course, we support German ship owners and we support coming under a German flag. Having said that, I must admit that we had a national maritime conference only in the beginning of last week. And the outcome of that is I'm not aware of because I was busy otherwise. I have not been there. I have, I'm not responsible for these parts. I am and solely dealing with maritime safety. So <coughs> if at all, I can only take your question back if you need more answers on that. Thank you. Także dziękuję za to pytanie. To bardzo ważne pytanie. Mogę tylko powiedzieć, że my wspieramy niemieckich armatorów. W zeszłym tygodniu odbywała się konferencja na ten temat. Niestety byłam zajęta, nie brałam w niej udziału, a więc nie znam wyników ani wniosków z tej konferencji. A poza tym w zakresie moich obowiązków leży tylko sprawa związana z bezpieczeństwem żeglugi, więc jak gdyby jest to troszeczkę temat z boku na temat działań w zakresie bezpieczeństwa żeglugi. Mogę się wypowiadać, natomiast w pozostałych obszarach nie jestem najlepszą osobą do udzielenia tej odpowiedzi. Mr. Guinea, I wanted to ask you, uh, from the point of view of ship owners, can you tell us what kind of assistance do ship owners expect, need, or would like to see uh, from their states to make it easier to comply with the uh, regulations? <coughs> A big bag of money. Joking about that. It is evident, and you heard this morning somebody mentioning that the cost of installing of, of a scrubber not yet installed is about two million dollars. Uh, so it will be much higher if you install it, to test it, and so on and so on. Uh, there are different figures going around from two to five million. Uh, so in a way, if you want to avoid the motor ship, you need support one way or another. The same goes for uh, LNG. The problem is, as I mentioned, shall I continue? The problem is, as I mentioned, that uh, even if you get support, the financing of the thing is also difficult with normal banks. So a solution to that one has to be found as well. No muszę powiedzieć, że koszty są bardzo duże, bo mówi się o tym, że koszt zakupu jednego skrabera to jest około 2 miliony dolarów. To jest mowa o samym zakupie, a jeszcze kwestia instalacji, testowania i tak dalej. Mówi się o kosztach do 5 milionów, więc koszty są znaczne. Poza tym oczywiście, że potrzebujemy wsparcia z naszych krajów, żeby w tym momencie instalować czy dokonać takich inwestycji, by można było w pełni spełnić wymagania, jakie są w tej chwili narzucone w tym okresie, 
Ale jednocześnie musimy pamiętać, że bez jakiegoś wsparcia grozi nam również tak zwany moduł shift, czyli przerzucenie się transportu z transportu morskiego na transport lądowy, na transport drogowy. Jest jeszcze jedna sprawa, która wymaga rozważenia, która wymaga również jakiejś decyzji, w jaki sposób banki w tym momencie mają współuczestniczyć w tym procesie właśnie do inwestowywania czy, czy pomocy skierowanej armatorom. To jest kolejny problem. A question, what about this uh, recycling fee? Do you have the decision? Have you heard about it? Has it been fast adopted or not? Uh, you see a big smile on my face. <laughs> no, I just was informed that in the discussions in Parliament, the amendments 31 and 32 on the fund were rejected. And the Commission has been asked <coughs> to develop proposals for an incentive scheme by 2015. So the Commission has been asked by the Parliament to develop something on incentives by 2015. And uh, for the mandate, for the negotiations between the Member States, the Council and the Parliament, the rapporteur has got a mandate, but not on the fund. So, conclusion, time being, the fund is up. Widział Pan po szerokim uśmiechu na mojej twarzy. Zostało to odrzucone. Chodziło o punkt 31 i 22. Zdecydowano się na opracowanie propozycji pewnych działań zachęcających pewien program, tak zwany incentive scheme, który ma być opracowany do 2015 roku. Będą w tym czasie prowadzone negocjacje między państwami członkowskimi, Radą i Parlamentem. Perhaps I should add something to this. Uh, it's not a question whether we have to pay or we don't have to pay. It is of course a problem. But the main thing is that if the fund would have been accepted and eventually transferred into EU law, then the recycling states in Asia will never ratify the Hong Kong Convention, which means that globally you are back at square one on improving recycling conditions in the world. And the idea of shifting recycling from Asia to Europe doesn't make sense at all in practical terms. Także fakt, że ten fundusz, ta koncepcja funduszu została odrzucona jest bardzo korzystny, ponieważ większość jak wiemy złamowania stawki odbywa się w Azji i tutaj mamy konwencję Hongkongu. Hong Gdyby ten fundusz w tym momencie został wprowadzony, prawdopodobnie nie zostałoby, nie, nie, nie zostałoby to wszystko ratyfikowane, ta konwencja o recyklingu przez wszystkie państwa, a więc nie doszłoby do poprawy de facto sytuacji. A musimy zdawać sobie sprawę, że jest bardzo mało prawdopodobne, by złomowanie statku przeniosło się z Azji do Europy. How did you convince your government that the problem of the, uh, of the additional cost uh, the, the, of the um, uh, low sulfur fuels is not only the problem of the ship owners, but the whole, uh, whole society, whole industry? Because we, we have some problems with that important. I pytanie takie, czy do pana Widena, w jaki sposób armatorzy przekonali swój rząd, że ich problem jest, równy problem jest również problemem całego społeczeństwa, tak by rząd ten temat rozważył? Czy mógłby pan odpowiedzieć na to pytanie? Yes, thank you. Uh, good question. From, from day number one, when we made our first calculations and, and we realized that the additional cost for the Finnish society will be annually 836 million euros. 
a year. And then I immediately phoned to the Finnish uh, enterprises for the land-based industries and told them that, 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 that we are going to, to increase the, uh, the freight rates in 2015 with at least 50%. So, oh, then we must do something together. And, and we made an uh, uh, impact assessment and we also involved our Ministry of Transport and Communication together with the land-based industry. And they didn't believe us. So they made their own impact assessment. And it, when it was done, they come to absolutely the same figures. And after that, they, they realized, no, some, some, something must be done. And because they had been a very active part of the Marble Annex 6 uh, <coughs> decision in, in, in MVPC 58, so they were very ashamed. That's why I think that we have some good cooperation now. Thank you. Kiedy przekazaliśmy, że nasze koszty roczne armatorskie wzrosną mniej więcej o 846 milionów i że w związku z tym w następnych latach stawki fraktowe wzrosną o 50%, wzbudziliśmy zdecydowane zainteresowanie, że coś trzeba z tym fantem zrobić. Dokonaliśmy, przeprowadziliśmy ocenę oddziaływania tych, tych kosztów później na stawki i od, oddziaływania całości realizacji tej dyrektywy przez nas, wzbudziło to zainteresowanie ministerstwa, aż z drugiej strony uważali oni, że nasza ocena oddziaływania może być trochę przesadzona. W związku z tym przeprowadzono od strony rządowej kolejne badania oddziaływania, oceny oddziaływania, no i okazało się, że wyniki były w zasadzie takie same. W związku z tym, ponieważ nasz rząd przykłada dużą wagę do realizacji postanowień na przykład na polu części szóstej, w związku z tym zdecydowano się na podjęcie działań. Jako, że będę przygotowywał komunikat później, Chciałbym prosić pana dyrektora Francisa Safarię o wypowiedź, jak to się w Danii robi, że się konkurencję zostawia w parlamentarze, promując eco-ships, eco-friendly ships, zwiększając skalę i tak dalej, i tak dalej, i od strony polityki rządu. So, Mr. Sakari, I have a question to you. How does the Danish authority do it that you are so eco-friendly, you are eco-oriented on one hand, and on the other hand, you leave competitors in the uh, for water, where behind in the water, right? How, how do you do it? Thank you very much. I think you're too friendly. <laughs> but of course, we have worked many years on what we call quality of shipping. And, and the whole idea of having eco friendly and also friendly to the crew makes a better distance. It's something we have worked on many years. <laughs> Zwracamy dużą uwagę na to, żeby mieć tak zwany quality shipping, czyli wysokiej jakości żeglugę, zarówno przyjazną dla środowiska, jak i dla pracowników. I wydaje mi się, że to procentuje. Well, of course, it, it, it's very difficult to uh, retain the ships on the Danish flag, although we have more and more ships on the Danish flag, even after the crisis in 2007, and it's still racing. And we hope to get the three new big ships from Mask on the Danish flag as well, because that will really <laughs> give us a lot of tonnage. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but it is very, very difficult, and uh, we can see that the ships are uh, flying other flags as well. Uh, the largest ship owner in Singapore is Danish, <laughs> so uh, that is complicated. But I know from the Danish uh, Ship Owners Association that there policy is that they is ready to compete on everything also environmental issues as long as it is global global regulation they are not afraid of the competition rzeczywiście sytuacja jeżeli chodzi o ilość statków pływających pod tą flagą 
była trudna, w szczególności po kryzysie, który rozpoczął się w 2007 roku, ale mogę powiedzieć, że w zasadzie przybywa nam powoli do statku. W tej chwili liczymy na to, że może MERS, to jest to ogromny to nasz, olbrzymia flota, może zechce pływać pod naszą duńską flagą. I oczywiście również armatorzy duńscy pływają pod innymi flagami. Możemy powiedzieć, że na przykład w Singapurze jest całe mnóstwo duńskich statków. No i rozmawiałem również ze Stowarzyszeniem Duńskich Armatorów, którzy nie boją się konkurować na tym, na tym światowym rynku. Czy jeszcze są jakieś pytania? Jeśli nie, dziękujemy bardzo. Dziękujemy bardzo.